Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This last weekend, we saw two SpaceX launches carrying another two loads of Starlink satellites into space. And one of those flew on a booster that was flying for its ninth time and was successfully recovered, setting a new limit, a new standard, which is all very cool. But I was more interested by the fact that in Europe, a bunch of amateur radio tinkerers have managed to decode the telemetry that is broadcast by the second stage in orbit, including the footage from the engineering cameras. Now, if you've watched a SpaceX broadcast, you've probably seen footage from these very cameras. They have cameras pointing at the engines so they can check those work, sometimes a satellite deployment, and occasionally you might catch a glimpse of the camera inside the liquid oxygen tank showing the oxygen floating around in zero G as it sits in orbit. Now, normally on the SpaceX broadcast, they cut away for that stuff, but apparently the way this works is the cameras just cycle through through what they're programmed to do on the ground and the people producing the uh, live stream, they have to like switch away from the oxygen tank. So yeah, amateur radio tinkerers have figured out how to pull this apart. They use like one meter plus dishes, which have to be very carefully tracked to point at the spacecraft as it passes over the horizon. Now, SpaceX normally when they're doing their worldwide coverage, they have a number of base stations in different locations which they are using to receive the traffic, uh, you know, as the thing passes overhead. And they have to plan this out ahead for every mission. But yeah, this is being broadcast to everyone. So if you've got a big enough dish, you can do it. Now, that's getting the radio signals down, turning those radio signals into telemetry that can be decoded and something that can be understood is uh, not a trivial thing by any means. So... The, a lot of this is done, well, this is all done these days using something called software-defined radio. And as you can imagine, this is where you use software to define your radio, because in the old days, when radio first appeared, you would have to have a bunch of circuits that would take your input signal and modulate it and perhaps you know, filter it and send that. And then on the other end, you would have to demodulate it and do all your filters. All these different components can now be implemented in software because computers are fast enough. And a, you know, a few years ago, basically, it got suddenly got very, very cheap to build one of these software decoders because some hardware hackers realized that there was a, a digital TV dongle that you could buy for your PC that plugged it in via USB so you could watch you know, digital TV for those people that somehow hadn't heard of YouTube. But these things had a software-defined radio chip on them, and you could just change the software that was being run on those so that they could decode anything. They could talk to or listen to GPS or uh, all sorts of other stuff. And essentially, it's the same technique that's being used to talk to these satellites. Now, apparently, the frequency range, these are up in the S-band around 2.3 gigahertz. And apparently, that's too high for these cheap um, software-defined radio things. So there's another gizmo, which I don't quite understand, but apparently what it does is it just, it shifts the frequency down so that you can use your you know cheap software uh, decoder to actually decode the whole thing. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, you, so you're decoding it, but just because you can see there's a signal there doesn't mean that you can necessarily figure out what's going on with it. And that requires a whole lot of understanding what's going on. And frankly, I'm amazed at people that were able to look at this and figure out how it all turned, how it, a bunch of radio noise turned into a bunch of bits. And a lot of the work was apparently done in the sense that SpaceX followed known standards. There's something called the Space Data, or sorry, the um, the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, CCSDS, and they have a bunch of standards for good practices um, to basically say how you should build your telemetry system. So a lot of that stuff was already there and they just needed to figure out which options SpaceX had picked. It wasn't encrypted, although there is something called a scrambler or randomizer, which is like a standard thing when you're trying to do high you know, data dense communication, because the way radio works, if you want to send a bit stream and you have like a whole bunch of zero bits, you don't want to send those as just zeros because you actually need the signal to be going and alternating bits, essentially, so that uh, you still have reference transitions for your timers and so that you're not using 
you're not focusing too much of your radio energy on one part of your band pass and letting the other sit around doing nothing. So this was a standard, this isn't an encryption system, this is just an encoding system that ensures that you get the most out of your uh, radio spectrum, let's say. But that was a standard one. Once they got that down and they got past the error correction, they had a bit stream. And I sort of understand decoding bit streams. In this case, what they did was they aligned it to bytes and then just ran a Unix strings command. What that does is it just looks for ASCII text. And sure enough, they found a bunch of bits where it had messages from GPS software saying, oh, having trouble doing this or locking on. These were just English human readable text messages. And I think this is debug logs from GPS subsystems. Uh, but yeah, they, once you get through that, you start to see that there are packets with you know header sizes and uh, you know various structures on it. There's a bunch of different packet types. Only a few have been figured out, but the most interesting one is of course the ones that contain video, and these are just standard MP4, MPEG4 transport streams, which is container format containing H.264 uh, video. And once you take all that, you can turn that into video streams and you can watch the stuff without the SpaceX uh, you know, producers switching you away when you really wanted to take a look at that oxygen tank. So look, this is obviously very cool. I'm not sure how long they'll be able to do this for. It's entirely possible that SpaceX decides that they don't like people looking in this or they. it might be that they actually find there's some legal requirement for them to secure their streams a little more. But I'm, I'm not sure about that. I know actually there's apparently some of the missile treaties uh, between the US and Russia require that ICBM test telemetry not be encrypted so that each country can spy and you know determine that the the performance claims that are being made are legit. I, I don't think that necessarily applies to rockets in space. It is also worth noting that one of the individuals involved in this also was uh, responsible for tr getting data from the Chang'e 5 spacecraft and getting images from their engineering cameras. So that, again, uh, I'm, su I'm surprised that one isn't encrypted. But yeah, look, this is a whole fascinating field. I, I occasionally meet people that work in you know RF design and it blows my mind. They have this whole language that I don't quite understand, but there's enough of it that I know that it fascinates me. So it'll be interesting to see how long we can keep doing this for. Interesting to see if we can see anything else. What we've got, and the most interesting thing we have, I think, is the images from inside the oxygen tank. Because we do see sometimes, in this case, uh, little blobs. They're, people are saying they're bubbles. No, these are spheres of liquid oxygen floating around in the tank. But in another case, we saw the liquid oxygen more or less stuck to the bottom of the tank via surface tension. So I think you know, the different locations depend upon what kind of maneuvers have been performed by the spacecraft. Um, before they light the engines, they will, of course, use the reaction control thrusters to accelerate the booster forward so the oxygen ends and the, the fuel ends up on the bottom of the tanks. But after I think after you see an engine shutdown, you know, at stage two, that shutdown seems to be sufficiently violent that it knocks the, the propellant off the bottom and then it starts floating around. I would love to know more about this. I, you know, <laughs> I don't know why they're being so secret because I, I love it. But <laughs> I think they should put lasers in the tank and create like a cool laser show with blobs of oxygen flowing around. You know, spin the spacecraft. I don't know. I'm just being a little silly now. Yeah, so that, that's some fascinating stuff that happened this weekend. Mad props to the individuals who figured this out, and I hope to see more from you. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.